Mike Stenhouse, Peterman Prosperity, CEO, sorry. Paul Revere, huh? Well, if you, if you go by the beer I had yesterday, I'm really more of a Sam Adams guy. So. <laughs> and by the way, should I get on your bad side by telling you right away that I'm a massive Green Bay Packers fan, so sorry. <laughs> You're not a patriot. Um, good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank um, Prairie, the group that is hosting this. It's a, uh, this is Citizen Democracy in Action. Uh, Property Rights Alliance of Rhode Island sprung up just recently, specifically to fight on your behalf as, as landowners, property owners, or, or just citizens of our state. Uh, as you may know, I run a uh, public policy think tank, the Rhode Island Center for Freedom and Prosperity. And I guess, uh, Don, you're a little bit correct, I, I guess, because I, I think it was my op-ed in October that kind of started this, this um, statewide revolution, if you will. Um, I call it our land, our rights, our local government, because that's really what's at stake here. They will try to tell you it's, it's something different, but we know that it's not. Uh, just to wax a little poetic, you know, the American dream once meant at aspiring to own your own home as a symbol of your economic independence with a picket fence around the yard. But imagine instead a, a small unit in a high-rise apartment with a rail around a balcony. That's the American dream that the planners want you to accept. Uh, imagine further that if your town allows you to develop your own land and build a home on that land, on a quarter acre lot or bigger, that that would be considered discriminatory. The American dream, discriminatory. This is how it's being rewritten or with, uh, under, under the covers. And this is why you're here tonight to find out what's under the covers of Roadmap Rhode Island. And this is being pushed on you and us basically by unelected bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. with the willing assistance of our own state's division of planning. Mm -hmm. So to those who support Roadmap Rhode Island, while I wasn't going to give a Paul Revere cry, I, I, I will give you this analogy. This to you, to you those who support this plan and design this plan, especially those of you in Rhode Island, this is your 38 Studios moment. Yes, it is. Will, will they remain ignorant of the true implications of this plan, to rush to adopt it, and then try to claim in future years, well, I didn't know what was in it. I think we've heard that before nationally as well, until after it's passed, right? <laughs> Will we allow them to later deny responsibility for sending our state into yet another economic tailspin, and in this case, an avoidable tailspin? Or will they listen to you, the people, and us tonight, about what's really going on? So unlike 38 Studios, our center, Prairie, all, the, all of you, all the other groups, the Tea Party, and all the other groups that are out getting the word out, we are here to make sure that they can never claim that they didn't know. So let me give you a, a little background. Gary's gonna really give you the meat of the evening. I'm just trying to try to give you as much background as you can so you understand when, when Gary gets, gets to it. This goes back to as far back as 2006, when the Division of Planning be, began relating, uh, publishing related components. You, you ever see Land Use 2025? This is a plan for the whole state on where development would be and what places would be preferred and which places wouldn't. I mean, it's amazing to think that they've got it planned out where we can live and where we can't, but they do. So it started with that, and this was the, the beginning of the planners. Then in 2000, and, uh, before 2012, the Chafee administration put out an application and received a grant request from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, in Washington, D.C. to craft an economic development plan uh, based on HUD's six livability principles. 
HUD's principles, not Rhode Island principles, bureaucrats in DC. So in 2012, the administration put out an RFP asking for firms to apply to who would want to write that economic development plan. Now, it was all predetermined who it would be. I mean, it went to these national groups, um, Policy Link and Fourth Economy. They're out of state and they're known to be connected to the radical environmental, radical social justice movements. This was all pre-designed and a lot of what we saw with the RFPs and what I'll tell you about in the legislative process were all just stagecraft. Then in 2013, after this RFP had already been underway, the General Assembly passes a law requiring that the Division of Planning put forth an economic development plan every four years. After it, or, it had already started. Well after. The first draft of the plan was pure economic development. The final draft, some way along the way, had the, the term that opened the door for the major problem of this that must also have a major social equity component. And that, that was the little crack in the door that, that led to all this. So what happened was that clause allowed the plan to be hijacked by special interest groups. The consortium that was put together to write and consider the plan, no economics people there, just all special interest advocates for one special interest or another, and that's how Roadmap Rhode Island was born. There was one component uh, contributed by the Rhode Island Foundation um, from a Make It Happen event a few years ago that had some relatively decent economic ideas in them, but certainly not a roadmap. But other than that, the public buy-off they try to tell you that this plan had, the, little, the 12 or 15 little meetings of amongst themselves that they had throughout the state that some of us went to, might have been 10 or 12 other people, they're trying to say that that showed that the people of Rhode Island support this, and this was a plan of the people of Rhode Island. That was a complete sham. The Make It Happen event was a legitimate event. And I would point to the fact that in the three recent public hearings, the two in October, the week before the election, and the one um, last month when the, when the consortium met, those are the first three really well-publicized meetings, and I can tell you that, you know, I can see from the spirit of this room, that the public was overwhelmingly and vehemently against this plan, yet they still try to claim this is a plan of the, that the people of Rhode Island support. We cannot let them get, get away with that. They tried to sneak this plan by us. They either thought we wouldn't notice, like we did with the other meetings, or, to use a phrase that's become popular recently, they thought we were too stupid <laughs> to understand uh, what really lies beneath. I look out tonight, it's, it's tremendous that there's such interest in this. And I can tell you that we're not stupid, you're not stupid, we do know what's going on, and we are going to stop this thing. There are many aspects not to like about this so-called economic development plan. As I said, did you know it wasn't even conceived in Rhode Island? It was conceived based on six livability principles put forth by HUD in Washington, D.C. This is a cookie-cutter scheme. I've got a chart right here that shows we're just one of dozens in the country where they're trying to put similar plans through. So if they try to tell you this is a plan for Rhode Island, baloney. It's a plan out of Washington, D.C. Did you also know that the U.S. House of Representatives earlier this year actually passed a bill to cut funding for this, what they call Sustainable Communities Grant Program by HUD, because in the, in the bill it said, because of its uh, superseding effect on the sovereignty of local governments, which Gary will get into later on. So we're not the only ones, we're not the only Paul Revere's. There's some Paul Revere's in Washington as well, but of course uh, the Senate did not act on it last year. But the two big problems with this plan that we're here to talk about tonight are one, it is not an economic development plan, at least the way it was supposed to be, and as Gary will take you through in a few minutes, that the sovereignty of your locally affected, uh, elected town councils, along with your individual property rights, might be at risk. So with regard to economics, or the lack thereof in this, um, 
this Paul Revere has an economics degree from Harvard University, so I know a little something about economics. And I've studied this plan for two years. And there is nothing in here that would call it economic development. There are some cozily worded, lofty goals, vague, with no plan on how to achieve them. There's no cost-benefit analysis, no projections on public-private investment required and what the return on that investment might be, job projections, do we need to change tax rates to include our business climate, nothing like that. <clears throat> and speaking of investments, do you know that they have you in mind? You know, when you hear the government say, invest in something now, that means raise your taxes. <laughs> well, that's exactly what, how part of this plan is that they will actually do away with your local annual property tax cap to raise your taxes in order to fund, be one, one mechanism to fund these, these, this vision that they have. So you are the investors. Welcome. Are you ready to pay higher taxes? Especially for an unproven utopian plan like this? Already oh, are. Yeah. <laughs> And did you also know that the property taxes will be used as a weapon against you if you choose to live where they don't want you to live? Your, your rates will go especially higher, and they will use property taxes as an incentive for those who obey HUD's mandates. If you lived in their preferred zones and their preferred housings, you will pay about one-fifth or one-tenth of what everybody else would pay. So that, that would shift. That's a, I have a letter from Senator Mark Cote from Woonsocket who talked about this imbalance of property taxes that's going on right now in Woonsocket. Gary has a lawsuit on the same thing in Barrington. It's not the topic of his discussion. But this is happening and it's coming to a town near you if this plant passes. Um, Mayor Alan Fung, John Simmons from RIPEC, URI Professor Len Ladaro, our center and others actually also call out that this is, there's no economics in this. In fact, Professor Ladaro called, called a train wreck RI. Nice catchy tune, I think. Also in the plan was an open disdain towards the free market system. They mention it right in there. We do not believe the free market system can ever do this, this, or this. Therefore, the government has to step in and do it. You can either agree or disagree, but it's in there. Disagree. The government breaks everything it touches. <laughs> so what has happened is that economics has been confused with sociology. <laughs> when I was in Harvard and I took my economics classes, it was under an economics major, under a curriculum. There was a whole nother curriculum over here in a major called sociology. Almost everything in this roadmap, Rhode Island plan, is sociology. No economics. So our freedom to choose where we want to live is, is going to be replaced by big government mandates if this goes through. Our center has done the research. We've published a lot of information. We've seen what's happened in other states where similar plans have been put forth. We know what happens next. They have a technical point that nothing in the Roadmap Rhode Island plan talks about infringing on your property rights or the rights of locally elected officials. Of course they're not. They're not stupid either. They're not going to write it in the plan, but we know what happens next. Don't let them get away with it if you hear that argument. We're not the first state where they've tried this. We're the first state to consider adopting this as a policy, but these policies have them implemented in many cities and counties and other parts of the country. We've studied them. We'll be coming out with a major report in the next couple of days highlighting some more of those instances, so stay tuned. <coughs> so make no doubt, the federal government wants to control your communities and the local land use and housing decisions you make. And Roadmap Rhode Island is the vehicle to help make that happen. You know, I wonder a few things. Who are these unelected bureaucrats that want to plan our lives? Who are these people? Thank you. That tell us where to live, what kind of transportation we should take, 
<laughs> what we can or can't do with our own land. Who are these people? I want to make it the law that the common good should supersede our constitutional individual property rights. It's encouraging, as Don mentioned, that at the last meeting we had so many elected officials here to see more here tonight. They should be recognized. Representative Morgan, Senator Cote, Representative Gia Russo, Rep-elect Filippi, Senator-elect G, sent, sent letters, uh, co-signed a tripartisan letter. <laughs> Senator Raptakis has sent a letter. Doreen Costa, I know, has had discussions with leadership. And we, have, and we have many here tonight and many others. So the word is getting up. Senator Cote issued a statement. I won't, I won't read the whole thing, but he talks firsthand about how he has seen the destructive effects of HUD policies in one socket. And that when their delegation put in a bill last year or in 2000, yeah, last year to, to have property tax relief to say we can't afford to have all these properties that are paying such low property taxes by HUD mandate, which the state adopted as a state mandate, please give us some relief. But the Affordable Housing Sustainable Living Coalition and Governor Chafee got together and then they vetoed the bill. So they had to go with a supplemental tax increase that you all heard of. How many of you are ready for a supplemental tax increase in your town? So summing up, the call to action is important. I think the Tea Party site has a, how you can contact your legislature. See John, where are you? See John, he's got a handout I think for you. Do that, because they will listen to the real voice of the people. Roadmap Rhode Island does not represent the voice of the people, I'm sure of it. And we would summarize by saying that big government planning has clearly, over the decades, ruined our state's economy. And as Ronald Reagan once said, the more the plans fail, the more the planners plan. <laughs> and this is exactly what we're seeing here. Roadmap Rhode Island is the ultimate in government planning. Bad planning. And it must not be adopted. If it's adopted, while it doesn't necessarily mean anything specific, it will become the official guide of the state of Rhode Island from which will flow regulations from many of the state departments, local ordinances, laws in the General Assembly, executive orders before the General Assembly probably even has a chance to deal with it. It will be adopted as the official state guide and you know they're going to rush to get stuff done before our duly elected representatives can stop this plan from unelected bureaucrats. So we must not allow this 38 Studios style plan to ever see the light of day. And to show you about some of the dangers now in your communities, I um, want to introduce Gary Morse, who has been a true um, fighter on this. He's been kind of battling this on his own in Barrington for years. We're pleased that he's helped us take up the cause on the state level. He's become an expert of sort of HUD's uh, policies and some of the legal aspects of it. So please, uh, please welcome Gary Morse.